got some rain, so praise God for that. Uh, we needed it. Uh, and glad to see you all here. This is the last Sunday of Easter, so uh, after this, next week we'll be celebrating Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, so it's good to see you all here as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, which gives us eternal life. A number of announcements before we get started. First of all, you may have noticed there's a table set up in the narthex in the back of the church there with some uh, uh, clippings and pictures from kind of the history of our church. Uh, someone just came by the parsonage and gave Brenda a big bag of stuff. So this was my mom's from East Lutheran, and it was full of all sorts of great things. So take a look at those. Uh, there's probably some interesting things back there. Um, also, uh, since it is summertime, Sunday school has ended, but uh, our superintendent, Cornette, has just informed me the next three weeks we're going to be doing uh, some game time, some crafts and stuff like that for the children during the Sunday school hour. And that also she'll bring some stuff out to the park too for our service in the park. So if you know any little ones, invite them on out. And we'll be having some, just some fun time during the Sunday school hour in the next three weeks. Um, and if you have any questions about that, you can ask me or Lynette after the service. Uh, I already mentioned it, service in the park and the pop-up is coming up on the 15th. Actually, the service time, I made a typo last week, it's actually 10.30. 10.30 and we'll be eating at 11.30, so just make a note of that. Midway Bible class continues. There's a note there about all being on vacation the next, uh, in a couple weeks here. And then just note the calendar, Wednesday elders meeting, Bible class continues, and ladies eight at two. Does anyone else have any announcements, any left to mention, or any prayer requests? All right, I'll invite you to rise and greet one another with a peace of our Lord.
please rise. Page 184. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you pray the of my sins. We take a moment for personal reflection. O oh, Almighty God, the merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Come on, this, your confession. I, by virtue of my office, as a call and ordained servant of the Word, and that's the grace of God and follow. And in the sent by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the intro, which is found in your bulletin. I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. And to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning. It is now and will be forever. Amen. I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make
The first reading for this last Sunday of the Easter season comes from Acts chapter 4. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, and sat for his journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John, John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All of these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120, and he said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us, and was allotted his share in this ministry. And now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels touched out. And he came known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Telegram, which is filled with blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, you who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is from 1 Peter, chapters 4 and 5. <laughs> Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the house of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered for a while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise to the Hallelujah and verse. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, 
to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I have before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. They are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Let us join in confessing our faith in this Christ who gives eternal life in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven. And was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and he was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with the Lord to judge both of the living and the dead, whose kingdom will not go in. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and our church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life.
executions are typically king. Killers are marched down death row in their prison guard, with shackles rattling their hands and feet. Usually an opportunity for some last words is given, and they either shamefully say they're sorry, or they break down. <laughs> they shamefully sit ignorant of their own shame and say nothing. They speak words of rebellion, still deluded that their crimes were worth it, or weren't crimes at all. Executions are typically shameful. This was especially true in the older days, when there weren't as many rules regarding cruel and unusual punishment. When the governments wanted the executions to be full of shame, one of these criminals to be examples to the people. You don't do what we say, and yet this will be you, full of shame, facing death. There's no wonder that many were beaten or tortured first and stripped down naked to face whatever cruel punishment was in store for them. Executions full of shame. What I'm reading today, Jesus was soon to be on death row, facing an execution. And while these words in our gospel lesson are not his last words, they're close to it, it's the end of his farewell speech to the disciples, and of course the ends of the prayer. And the shocking thing about this prayer is that even though he is going to an execution, a supposedly shameful one, Jesus does not speak of shame. He speaks of glory. Glory. Now we just celebrated Easter. Thursday, this Thursday was the ascension, where Christ ascends into heaven to the right hand of God. And days before Jesus gives the speech in our gospel lesson, he was transfigured on the mountaintop. He was shining bright. And while Jesus is certainly glorified at all those times, it is here, at the brink of his execution, where he talks about it. On death row, he makes a point to talk about glory. Here, when the hour of his death is at hand, normally a shameful time, here, he speaks of glory. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. He goes on to say, I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The death of Jesus shows forth the glory of God. Think about it. God is many things. But the greatest thing about God is His love and His mercy. We all know that we are sinful people. We deserve to be wiped out for our sin. But in His mercy, He came to us because He loves us. God is merciful. So, if we think about it, when is Jesus in His ministry most blatantly showing forth the fact that He is God in the flesh? When He dies for us. Because that is where He most blatantly shows forth His mercy and His love. That He would die for us? He would die like a criminal for us? That is why the crucifixion of Christ is glorious. That's why it is God. Because it is God Himself doing what He does. Loving. And showing mercy. Us. And that's not shameful, is it? No. It's glorious. Glorious. Especially for us, we Christians who believe it actually happened. Because we also realize that we need that mercy and love He showed on the cross. Otherwise, we couldn't stand the shame of our crimes. Can you imagine 
Put the thoughts in our heads or broadcast aloud. Now we couldn't show up to school. We couldn't show up to work or church or anything. The shame would be unbearable. And that's exactly why we glorify God. Because of the death of Jesus, He takes our shame away and gives us forgiveness. But we don't just need God's mercy for the things we are ashamed of. We need it for the things we are proud of, too. Because let's face it, we often seek glory in the wrong places. Is the glory we seek in doing acts of service like Christ did? Or is it in proving that other person wrong? And doing whatever it takes to get the next thing we want on our wish list. You see, glory, when you have to step on another person to get it, is no glory at all. It's shameful. Now, I'm not saying we can't be proud of them now. I'm not saying we can't try to win at the softball games now. I'm saying we shouldn't lie, cheat, and steal to get what we want and push out anyone in the world that's standing in our way. Because that puts the object, what we desire, the glory of the world, it puts that above the neighbor who we're pushing out of the way, and it puts it above God. And God just doesn't work that way. Because as we see in the crucifixion of Christ on the cross, we see that Christ finds glory, mercy, love, and forgiveness. So let us repent. Let us turn back from our sins that are so shameful. Our sins that are against God's word. Let us repent of our misplaced pride that wants to be better than everyone else. And let us seek that which is good, wholesome, and merciful. Because that is something to be proud of. That is something glorious. We will fall short. We will. We all have already. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Things first. But the cross is there to remind us of the forgiveness won by Jesus. Our Lord comes and helps us in our reading today. Jesus said a prayer. And he said a prayer for you. I came from you and they believe that you sent me. I am praying for them. It's you, those who believe. He's praying for you. All mine are yours and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. He is glorified in you. How? When you do what he does. Forgiving, showing mercy and love. But most importantly, most importantly because we will fall short of that. <laughs> Showing mercy and love all the time. We know we will. So most importantly, we glorify God by simply believing in Him. Because it is through faith that we are united with Christ. That we receive the benefits of His execution on the cross. And it is through faith that we are given eternal life, eternal glory. And it is through faith that we are strengthened to show His mercy in the first place. We glorify God by trusting that His mercy is for us. As He has called us through His Word, or the wet Word, baptism, whatever it may be. We glorify God by trusting that His mercy is for us. So let us stand firm in that faith. So that even if we face an execution, even if we face death, oh, we're not going to go there thinking of shame. I don't know. But the Lord. Glory of eternal life that awaits us. In the meantime, let us reflect that glory of God in our lives. He helps us, He prayed for us, He sends the Spirit. Let us reflect the glory of the one who, even on death row, is still thinking of others, thinking of you. In fact, even as He died, He thought of you. There's a whole reason He died to give you. Forgiveness, eternal life, and eternal life of glory, where we will see and share in His glory forevermore. Amen.
And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keeps our keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our risen Savior, till we see His glory face to face. Amen. Our service continues on page 192. We'll join in the singing of the offertory. Amen. Um, 
omnipotent Lord Jesus, as you come to us in your true body and blood, restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish us in the faith. Forgive us our sins and guard our souls as we wait the day when we will join in your eternal wedding feast on the mountain where you swallow death forever. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And our service continues on page 194 of the service of the sacrament. Page 194. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts.
all my God, that you have refreshed us with this salutary gift. And we implore you that your mercy would strengthen us with the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Come, Lord Jesus, we are. 